Yep. I actually wanted to thank Mort for giving me some flexibility here. When he asked me to speak about cost effectiveness after Leslie, I thought, how can I possibly do that again since I did that last year? <laughs> it was hard, tough, tough to do last year. It would only have been harder this year. And I wanted to thank Erling and Mort for doing a great job putting the first shape document together. As I read it, though, I kind of felt like I was walking a tightrope. And I had some thoughts, and so I put these thoughts together here. It's clear we all have to follow a delicate balance of advocacy and enthusiasm on the one hand and on scientific caution and objectivity on the other. And within this balance, I had a few topic areas I wanted to cover. One is on selecting screening populations, generalizing our data, assessing our technologies, and defining efficacy. And the first one that comes up is who to screen. And the balance here is in screening too many and in screening too few. And I noticed that uh, as we, uh, we've talked about this tonight a lot, that this issue that the Greenland paper has brought up that everybody has a risk factor but that has an event, but so does everyone who doesn't have an event. And stated a way that hasn't been said tonight, it's really a problem of specificity. As a clinician, you feel this. You feel that now everyone's identified as being at risk and you really don't know where to turn. And so there's room for new test development to discriminate risk, and I think we all in this room believe this. And we're asked to start with clinical risk from the Framingham Risk Score, and I thought it was interesting that in the SHAPE documents, risk factors on the basis of this inability to discriminate have been really seriously demoted. And I thought that was a, a bit stepping out a little, it was stepping out a little bit, which I think is important. It starts, it gets us all thinking. It's clear that the Framingham Risk Score is only very modestly accurate for in its, in its predictive power, and it creates other problems as a clinician, uh, the first of which is the huge intermediate risk group. These are Framingham data across ranges of age and the proportion of individuals that fit into various risk strata. Here, age 50 to 70-year-old people, there's a good half of the population that's intermediate risk, and we've talked about this tonight. But the other thing we haven't talked about tonight that extends from this is that this is where all the population attributable risk lies. And so it makes sense to target an intermediate risk pro population as our first approach so that we would have this goal in mind in refining a risk prediction, taking an intermediate risk population, performing a test to shift up the initial to the post-test probability, defining someone whose risk now exceeds a coronary heart disease equivalent, and changing their risk approach in terms of their therapeutic approach. We addressed this very carefully in the 34th Bethesda Conference published a little over a year ago, and it was decided in that conference that an intermediate risk group was the most practical for screening for these reasons, that a population attributable risk lied in the intermediate risk group, that in low-risk patients there would likely be poor, poor cost effectiveness, and in high-risk patients there would be limited management impact. I just wanted to address these other populations, though, for a moment. Uh, and it's clear that even NCEP is now in the game, uh, stating in their 3R, in their revised ATP3 document two months ago, uh, stating in persons with multiple risk factors, high coronary calcium scores uh, that is above the 75th percentile for age and sex denote advanced coronary atherosclerosis and provide a rationale for intensified LDL lowering therapy. So the momentum is built for intermediate risk patients. It's clear, though, as we've seen tonight and the data here from many, uh, that coronary calcium indicates increased risk within all strata of Framingham risk score groups. And I guess there's, and this is South Bay Heart Watch data from Dr. Detrano's group showing us that across strata of Framingham risk scores, one sees that high calcium scores tend to indicate higher risk, such as there's a hazard ratio increment of about twofold when the calcium score exceeds 300 in his data. But I think there's two ways to interpret this as I see it. One is that the calcium score modulates the risk. And we focused here on these intermediate risk groups, that is, these folks at high calcium scores have higher risk. It's also that the clinical risk modulates the atherosclerosis. The, the risk factors modulate the atherosclerosis. So I have misgivings about really demoting risk factors in this setting. Um, that is to say this, that if you've got a calcium score over 300 in Bob's data, and every piece of data I've seen tonight support this same concept, and that is that, uh, and this is whether it's uh, uh, Alan Gersey's data or Leslie's data on calcium imaging, and the same applied even to IMT and other screening procedures that are imaging. That is at low risk, 
although you're higher, at higher risk with a calcium score of 300, if you're at low clinical risk, a calcium score of 300 doesn't mean the same for risk as it does at very high clinical risk. So I think it's difficult to divorce these two concepts of risk factors and risk markers or atherosclerosis in the sense that calcium, in this instance, modulates the clinical risk and clinical risk modulates the atherosclerosis risk. If we wanted to, though, for a moment, consider the issue of should we screen low-risk patients, I think there's several ways to make pro-arguments. Uh, the first is that low-risk patients are very plentiful. Uh, subclinical disease is still quite common. These are data from the PAC project, which I run, in which we've looked at a low-risk group and their quartiles of, uh, into, dividing them into quartiles of Framingham risk, looking at the prevalence of calcium. Even on people with very low clinical predictive risk, there's still a lot of subclinical atherosclerosis, and this is a theme we've heard about tonight. And it's, in fact, perhaps these low-risk people who have the greatest potential to demonstrate a discrepancy between their expected and their observed risk, so providing an argument for screening low-risk people. Certainly, their therapeutics and these targets would be most dramatically altered in low-risk people. On the con side, events are still, rel still, still relatively uncommon, and these are even Bob Detrano's data, again, the same theme throughout tonight, that events are still less common in this lower risk group. As we're even seeing in the PAC project, these are unpublished data, but we now have up to six-year actuarial follow-up in this group of 2,000 individuals. And we now have an odds ratio of 12 for an incident coronary heart disease event. If you've got any coronary calcium present, this is at a mean age of 42 after controlling for the Framingham risk score. So it's these data that support screening, but again, events are relatively uncommon. This is an aggregate of 10 total events after six years of follow-up of 2,000 people. So it's statistically significant, but again, events are very uncommon, even though these people are at an age of where you could screen and that they're over 40. How about high risk? We tend to dismiss screening high risk people because we think that their therapy won't change. If it's not gonna change your therapy, don't do the test. But it's clear this is a group in which in risk factors that are, are in fact enriched, and we know from high-risk patients that their therapeutic uh, penetrance and therapeutic adherence is low, giving us an opportunity to detect a highest of the high-risk group to alter their treatment, uh, their, their therapies, as well as the adherence to those therapies. In fact, it could identify a group in whom we would treat them beyond the guidelines. And perhaps in a patient with a negative test, perhaps even downgrade or demote their therapeutic intensity. Uh, and certainly here again within the South Bay data, at very high clinical risk, uh, high calcium scores, incrementally predicted risk. So once again, we see this concept that subclinical atherosclerosis modulated the clinical risk, as we'd like to see, but also the clinical risk modulated the risk of the atherosclerosis that was present. Even in patients with known heart disease, these, these data from the Essence study of, pay, of 150 men uh, selected on the basis of their calcium score uh, an already manifest heart, heart disease, those with calcium scores over 1,000 had higher risk of events than those with lower scores, providing the rationale that we could even discriminate risk further after someone already has a CHD equivalent, known CHD. But coming back to the Bethesda conference, again, it concluded that an initial risk factor assessment is the appropriate starting point. Again, because risk factors modulate atherosclerosis, but also atherosclerosis modulates the risk of risk factors. I think on this basis, atherosclerosis imaging would be supported for intermediate risk patients, and we've seen this now in multiple emerging guidelines. And that before we can, I, in my view, before I can really adopt screening low-risk patients or screening high-risk patients, we need two things. First, to demonstrate that it's not gonna be poorly cost-effective to screen low-risk patients. And secondly, in high-risk patients, that the trade-offs between limited management impact versus an outcomes effect uh, really affects the management strategy in an incremental way. Moving on then to the next tension or balance we want to strike is how far do we generalize our data? Uh, we can suffer from too little evidence-based medicine and in my perspective, too much evidence-based medicine. Uh, what I mean by this is this tension within evidence-based medicine, the desire to be data-driven versus the fact, the simple fact, the reality, that time and money don't necessarily allow us to address all questions in a way that is directly studied and answered by investigation. I think a simple example of this is the, and the reason for caution comes out of some data on race and coronary calcium and outcomes. Um, and 
The data here, again, from South Bay show us the outcomes after fluoroscopy in black and white patients, that blacks had worse risk factor profiles, less calcium, one, uh, fully a third uh, less coronary calcium, but an odds ratio of two for events, worse outcomes despite less coronary calcium because probably of race-related differences in coronary calcium development. I think this makes us realize that we have to be cautious in overextending guidelines to screen everybody uh, and at the same time advocate for studies in diverse populations, for example, as the MESA study is doing. It's not that we can do nothing in these patients. There are alternatives. For instance, instead of doing calcium scanning in African Americans, shift our approach to doing IMT testing where race-related differences are minimal. So I think the solution here in terms of not wanting to suffer from too little or too much evidence-based medicine uh, is that there's no single answer, but we need to be cautious prior to data extension, extend data where it's reasonable. But again, it's data, data, data. And I think for SHAPE, one thing SHAPE can do is identify areas of need uh, where data is limited before just extending into areas of uncertainty. Another area of tension is how should tests be accessed. This issue of open access versus a gatekeeper model. Uh, the, I think the case for open access to screening, and I think this is probably crucial within shape for the program to be successful, is that there's open access to screening. You can't screen 50 million people waiting for the doctor to order the test. And I think the case for this is the fact that provider belief in the strengths of tests is often in advance of endorsement by guidelines. We have internal beliefs which we think are data-driven, we believe are data-driven, they probably they are data-driven, The guidelines are slow to adopt to those uh, beliefs. There's also the fact that we believe in patient autonomy, that patients should choose their own way and that patients that choose their own way are invested in their health. And lastly, the fact that, frankly, tests don't penetrate quickly into the marketplace because payers are slow to adopt reimbursement, which is really the thing that triggers uh, the broad application of tests. On the other hand, we have to be cautious about potential adverse effects of screening tests. And as we promote the need to screen for subclinical disease, we should be mindful at least of the fact that there are, all fa are false positives and false negatives that need to be fully defined and recognized, that there are incidental findings, costs associated, labeling issues, the issues of discriminating statistical and clinical significance, and then the issue of premature implementation. implementation. We can't afford mistakes to, pre to prematurely implement things, otherwise we erode confidence in our approach. I think there also has to be, as we approach this, balance in consumer promotion. A publication will come out soon in Archives of Internal Medicine telling us that in, in, in screening tests, not in, sorry, atherosclerosis screening tests, but in screening tests for health, there's too much negative valence. That is, too much negative comments, too much fear-mongering, and that supportive claims need to be based on achievable expectations, and that this is too often present. Unfortunately, there's no regulatory oversight for here, for this area. I don't want regulation. I think it's unlikely we'll get regulation, but we have to regulate ourselves and be balanced in our consumer promotion in this. And so to achieve this balance, I think we need study designs and promotes, to promote study designs that demonstrate a range of potential effects, both positive and negative, and that as we approach screening, there needs to be a safety net. And that safety net, I would hope that SHAPE would endorse. That is one in which we encourage appropriate utilization through pre-screening, that we encourage quality measurements of our endpoints, and that we fully treat the abnormalities, because in the end, it's the treatment that's going to prevent the event, not the screening. In other words, balancing our enthusiasm and objectivity. And last is defining efficacy. And I think this depends upon your focus, which, from which direction you come at this problem. Uh, the balance between a test, showing a test is predictive from showing a test is cost effective. I think this predictive approach is a patient-focused approach, whereas the cost effective concerns come from a societal perspective. It's all one big world. We can live together. But there's a tension here, whether you're taking care of patients, taking care of populations. I think market forces create a lot of this tension. There's clearly pressure for short product and market time with rapid deployment of devices leading to direct consumer marketing. The problem is that the FDA is flooded with new app device applications every year, 4,000 a year. And so the claims that are, in, the claims that are approved by the FDA uh, or the, the level of rigor for claims approved by the FDA for devices is much lower than it is for drugs. And so what we need is things like shape, reliance on scientists, 
reliance on these scientific statements from medical societies. In the end, though, it's unfair, I think, to pin a cost-effectiveness against predictive value because the two are very, very, very different. Co predictive value is simply one component of cost-effectiveness. It's one key component, but it's, in fact, not the most key component. These are data from a, a tornado diagram from a cost-effectiveness study we published looking at the influence in terms of the range of cost-effectiveness measured in the marginal cost for quality-adjusted life years saved, looking at ranges of variables in the sensitivity analysis that might occur. I showed this last year uh, that the efficacy of primary prevention is crucial. Uh, efficacy could be defined as both the strength or the ability of drugs to prevent events, but also how well we use them, how commonly we use them, how well patients adhere to them. And that is if a drug is ex if drugs or, or treatments are extremely effective, a screening method to prevent events through disease detection is going to be highly cost effective. But if patients don't aren't given drugs, don't take drugs, or drugs are ineffective, no screening test will ever be cost effective. Other the predictive value is important, but so are things like the cost of medications and in fact the costs of the tests themselves. So in the end, I think that while we worry about predictive value, incremental predictive value, it's clear that cost effectiveness is something very different, comes from a societal perspective, and will be a partnership of imaging modalities that are accurate and independent, providers who want to test and treat the targets, patients who want to adhere to what we say, health systems to provide us access to tests and therapies, and industry to provide us effective and inexpensive therapies. In the end, I think it's a delicate balance for shape. I think it's one of balancing advocacy and enthusiasm with scientific caution and objectivity while we try to push the envelope a little bit, which I think SHAPE clearly does. It's balancing patient focus and societal focus. And in the end, I think the thing that brings us all together and will lead us to this promised land of balance and everything existing together nicely is research that we all perform and leadership by things like SHAPE. So, Mort, thanks for open mic night. I appreciate it. I know it's, uh, it's my pleasure to come. Thank you again for the invitation, and I hope I've sparked some thoughts at least. <laughs>